So hello, everyone. Uh, it's great to be back here again. Uh, I, I remember this venue. I will always remember this venue because of the view of the Golden Gate Bridge. I used to live out in this area, and it's, it's always a pleasure to come back. Uh, one, of, one of the things that I, I'd like to start off with is that most people don't know the history of where the term drone came from. I was curious about that, so I went out, you know, searching on the internet, and I discovered that it's actually quite a fascinating story. So when the advent of the aircraft and aircraft coming along as a, as a military threat during the time period between World War I and World War II, the British Navy got to be very concerned with dive bombers affecting, you know, basically attacking their battleships. And so in the 30s, they were very concerned that they had no way for their crews to do target practice on aircraft doing dive bombing runs because you can't really tow a target behind an aircraft dive bombing because, you know, it would be impossible to hit the target, not the tow aircraft. So they were perplexed at how to practice this. So the, the, the brilliant minds in the British military came up with the idea of taking World War I surplus aircraft, the Gypsy Moth twin uh, uh, biplane, and they equipped it with radio control equipment. So it basically became a radio control aircraft. And they would fly them to basically dive at the ships and then become target practice for the, for the crews. So when they started looking for a name for this new type of aircraft, they went to a model from the natural world, the bees. So in the beehive, there are three kinds of bees. There are worker bees who do all the work. There's the queen bee who makes more worker bees. And there are also the drone bees, the male bees, who do nothing other than hang out until a queen is born in the hive. And then they have one job, and that's to impregnate the queen during one flight, and at the end of that flight, they die. So what better name for an aircraft whose sole purpose in life is to fly once and die at the end? So that's how the term drone was attached to remotely piloted aircraft way back in the 30s. And they're still somewhat called, the, the DOD still calls them that today for the aircraft that are actually used as target practice. They still call them drones. However, they, like me, like to prefer to call the ones that are intended to go out and come back and do that multiple times, remotely piloted aircraft systems, which is the international ICAO term for these aircraft. So you won't, you won't hear me calling them drones unless I'm talking about something that's intended to be shot down. But I, I don't think that many people know that story, and I think it's a pretty, pretty fascinating story. Today I want to talk to you about um, essentially the progress we've made since I was here last year. Uh, about all, Last year I was talking about things that, that could happen in the future. This year I'm going to have the privilege of talking about a lot of stuff that we've done, and we begin to enable this industry to operate according to the FAA rules, uh, and which I think is... Uh, really marvelous thing that has happened over the last year. Obviously, we still have public aircraft operations ongoing. I think the last count were over 700 uh, authorized public aircraft ops in, in the United States today. Uh, that's universities, obviously the military, other government agencies, states, local governments. We have 20 some odd uh, law enforcement organizations who operate every day. And that's still ongoing. But the good news is there's a lot of group civil aircraft operations today, uh, both from experimental for use for research and development, but also in a couple of restricted category of aircraft that uh, were approved last year. They're still operating today on the north slope of Alaska, and they're looking to expand those operations into the lower 48. But the big news is Section 333 and the small rule. And obviously, there are still lots of hobbyists out there flying. Now, I'd like to give credit uh, to the Motion Picture Association of America for essentially pioneering the Section 333 approach. And, and I love to use these two pictures because hopefully you can see from the back of the room. But in this picture, you have a traditional manned helicopter flying over a set, filming what's going on. You see these flying below the, the, the roof line here. And you know, this is obviously a, not the safest of operations. I mean, the, the MPAA has very strict guidelines about how to do this. They have safety manuals about how to do this. And they, they work really hard, but they still have to 
fairly spectacular mishap. On the other hand, this is a scene from filming of a movie using a remotely piloted helicopter uh, operated by this guy's vehicle. It isn't moving, they, they park it and fly it. But then obviously this operation is putting the people on the set at much less of a risk than that one. So that the idea that uh, Lauren Reed from then of the MPA, now she's gone up on the hill to be a staffer, brought to me three years ago was that, hey, you know, we know how to do this, we do it in other countries, we should be able to do it in the US. <clears throat> but she also was the first one to point out that Section 333 of the FAA Reauthorization Bill actually allowed us to exempt these aircraft from the aircraft certification requirements, which was then and still is one of the big barriers for entry <coughs> into uh, operating in the NAS. So uh, Lauren went out and recruited six companies, six filming companies, to be the guinea pigs. Uh, they all worked uh, together. They came up with their own proprietary manuals in there, but they all uh, applied together and ran with grant, uh, all six of them last fall. And so we, we've actually come a long way since those first six. Uh, another great example, I love these pictures. I would not want to be one of these dudes right here, standing on this thing with that big fire going. Obviously the wind's blowing that way, but what if the wind shifts? I mean, it's just crazy to do that. But then you look at this exact same scenario with the unmanned aircraft operating, and you see that that is just way safer, way smarter way to do business. Now, the, the limits on what we're doing for Section 333 are pretty similar to uh, what we've seen in a small pool. Uh, basically, low 400 feet, uh, less than 50 knots, visual line of sight. Uh, the, no, we're giving an exemption from the airworthiness, but the responsibility for you know, the vehicle being in a condition for safe flight rests upon the pilot. Uh, they have to follow the manufacturing maintenance requirements. Uh, they have to have a pilot certificate. One of, the, one of the things that most people don't understand the nuances of law and regulations is that every federal agency is given basically marching orders by the Congress called an authorization. And that's where Congress says, okay, federal agency, these are the things you can regulate. And in, the, and in a lot of cases, they'll put in very specifics. So for the FAA, the specific, some of the specifics around aircraft operations is that every aircraft has to be registered. Every aircraft has to have a certificated pilot at the controls, and every aircraft has to have an airworthiness certificate. So up until 2012, when they said you can make an exception for small unmanned aircraft, the FAA had to have some form of airworthiness certificate in order to operate an unmanned aircraft, and that was the big barrier for entry. So this was a very big deal for us to have that, that kind of permission. But they didn't exempt us from the requirement in the legislation to have a certificated pilot at the controls. So that's why we originally started out with a private pilot, and then now we've backed off to just a sport pilot. And the big difference between sport pilot and private pilot is there's a lot of difference in the hours required to get it, but the medical requirements are much, much lower. You only have to have a driver's license, which is basically to prove that you have decent eyesight. So that was a huge step forward and opened up a lot of possibilities for these, these new operations. Can't fly at night, which uh, some folks have, have talked about that being a fairly significant restriction, but uh, the bottom line is no one has yet brought data, back to what Patrick was saying, nobody has yet brought data to us showing us how you can see and avoid man aviation when it's dark. Uh, we've actually we've actually done some testing with uh, Customs and Border and determined that at night, yeah, you can see other aircraft a lot further away, but you can't really tell the relative position of your aircraft versus theirs. So uh, until such time as we have a better way of managing the visual line of sight operations at night are going to be difficult. Uh, you can't operate from a moving vehicle. You can't operate in densely populated areas or near people and structures not participating. That's really important because that's the safety justification for not requiring the aircraft to have any type of certification. If the aircraft control systems go, go haywire and crashes into some, somebody or something, the only way we can say that that's safe is by virtue of having the operations take place where it won't cause a significant risk. Uh, 
there's a, one of the more significant things we did recently. Let's say questions to the end so we don't get behind schedule. One of the more significant uh, changes we made recently is that uh, every aircraft has to comply with the, the rules of the rule book or get an exemption. One of those rules is what we call the right-of-way rules. And the right-of-way rules, one of the key parameters there is, and this goes across the entirety of the way we operate the national airspace system, is that every pilot has to remain vigilant to see and avoid other aircraft in visual conditions. Sort of the foundation for how the system works. Every time you're, you're landing in a commercial aircraft at an airport, chances are you're, you're being operated by a pilot who's seeing and avoiding the aircraft in front of them. And that's how the system works everywhere. So when you're flying an unmanned aircraft, you have to be able to, to accomplish that. However, and this is where the lawyers come in, the past, the rulings both from a, a, in court cases, etc., has, has ruled that C legally means pilot's eyeballs looking out the window of the aircraft. So by definition, every aircraft, every unmanned aircraft can be that rule. Now, the good news is that this particular rule is one that we're allowed to waive. So we waive that rule or grant a, uh, an authorization for an alternative means of compliance, and that's what the COA is all about. The CO is essentially legalizing the operation of the aircraft when it comes to this 91113. Eventually, we'll change the rule so that you'll be allowed to use an alternative means. And the small rule changes it uh, by virtue of the way it's written, so you won't have to get a co anymore. One of the big barriers for the early adopters under uh, Section 333, and here's a list of them, a uh, partial list, was that they had to go get this co authorization every time they flew. And sometimes it could take a week, sometimes several weeks, depending on where they were doing. The, the workload of the facility, et cetera. And, and it was very difficult for them to uh, do business that way. So we did a safety risk assessment and determined that, okay, flying below 200 feet, certain distances from airports, would be allowed without having to come back and get a specific location approval. Uh, that was released back in March, and it has been a huge improvement for a lot of the folks. Uh, others, there's no, no restriction that says you can't still get uh, higher altitudes or, or, or different or locations closer to airports, you just have to come and get a specific approval, a specific operation at that location. So that's where we've come. The, um, this is out of date. Uh, since the, we made these slides last week, we're now over a thousand uh, applications in. Uh, but I also want to point out that we're up to 230 grants, and that number will go up this week as well. We're releasing them in batches every week. Uh, the current number is 230 as of Friday, but it will soon go above that as well. So obviously there's a lot of folks taking advantage of this. I think that uh, it's a great initial step toward commercial operations, but it is an interim step. The exemption process was designed as an exception process, not an approval process. So it's taken us a while to figure out how to, how to move it forward as quickly as we can, but ultimately it's going to be uh, difficult uh, in the long term to deal with that. But uh, a couple of people have already mentioned that we have an excellent website that uh, gives you step-by-step -step instructions. Uh, and contrary to what some people might tell you, there is no requirement to go hire some lawyer to write this stuff up for you. All of the grants are available online and you can go look them up yourself. Uh, the key bit of proprietary information that most people have had difficulty with is the safety manual, uh, basically how you're going to operate safely. Uh, and that's what I think most people are selling you, is access to those safety manuals. Um, you can send questions. We have a, a joint email box here if you have specific questions. There is a tremendous amount of information on our website. So uh, please take a look at our website. It is a wealth of information. It is updated. Probably have new material going on weekly. Uh, and you can also subscribe to it. So when new material comes out, it will send you an email and let you know. But like I said, this is just an interim step. This is just to keep us 
going until the small rule comes out, which you know, I think is is probably one of my uh, proudest achievements in this job, getting getting this rule out and getting it out in a way that truly represents, I think, the appropriate level of regulation for the level of risk that provided to the system. And that's an initiative from the administrator of the FAA on down. Risk-based decision-making is the way the FAA is going to operate going forward. Uh, it's not just wrote, you know, apply the rules regardless. It's based on risk. And we think we've struck the appropriate balance for uh, the level of regulation for the level of risk. Now, a lot of folks have come back to us and said, well, wait a minute, there's all these other operations that you're not talking about, and what's the deal? This is just the first step in a long regulatory process that will eventually get to the point where we have a complete regulatory structure for all types of operations of unmanned aircraft. This step is intended to get the segment of the community that is the lowest risk operating as quickly as possible. So don't think that this is the be all end all and there's, there are other ways to get into operation other than this if you don't fit into this model, which most of the folks who are talking about doing package delivery, this doesn't serve them because they need to go beyond visual line of sight. But we have ways to improve those operations as well. Now, this is a self-contained rule. We essentially said, for the purpose of the aircraft that fit in this category, ignore the rest of the rule book. Just apply this set of rules. So we intended we deal with the, the aircraft, the pilot, and, and all of the other issues that are needed to get people up and flying. Fundamentally, based on the idea that the pilot must be able to see and avoid other aircraft, that's the compliance with 91113, and, and probably one of the most significant things about this change is no more codes. Once this rule is out, you're operating under this rule, no special approval required to enter the airspace. Ultimately, it's on the pilot to maintain, to make sure the aircraft is safe and you're operating in, the, in operating conditions that will allow you to see and avoid that. That means weather, airspace restrictions, etc. And those are all spelled out in the rule. Again, because the aircraft doesn't require certification, we put strict operating limits on where you can operate. It's similar to what, I mean, it's no coincidence that Section 333 restrictions are the way they are. We believe this is the appropriate level of risk for these aircraft. Now, not to say that these are going to be the final uh, parameters. The way the rulemaking process works is once we publish it for comment, we have to take into consideration every one of those comments. And the final rule will reflect the results of the, the review of the comments and the, the way forward to respond to them correctly. I think the, the most uh, significant rules are again no operation over people who aren't participants. Now, in, you see this picture here. These guys are participants. The, the guys in the control are participants in the operation because. The aircraft is flying over them for the purposes of filming them to support, you know, the, the students, etc. And so obviously they've all uh, signed away their life in order to play a very dangerous sport called football. Uh, and so the risk posed by this little air, aircraft above is, is kind of minimal. Now, last year, uh, completely unintentional on my part, this conference resulted in a lot of publicity for the FAA and for the, for the system that was definitely not my intent. Um, and I see Jack's here in the audience somewhere. Jack, there he is, yes, my good buddy Jack. Anyway, so the, uh, the idea is that, well, what have we done since last year, since we had our first rather highly publicized incident of an uh, unmanned aircraft operating fairly close to a manned aircraft? And we've done a lot. I think what everybody needs to understand is that these guys up here in this picture, they're, they're our allies. These, these people we have had no issues with forever. Modeling clubs are not causing any hazards to the NAS. They're operating safely. They have agreements with nearby airports. Uh, they're protected by law from regulation. And, and we get along with them very well. Rich Hansen is here in the audience, AMA. We have a memorandum of agreement with them to work together to promote safe model aviation. Not an issue. However, this picture is picturing a new breed of model aircraft operator. 
and they are folks who are not part of the aviation system. They don't even realize they're in the aviation system when they fly their toy that they bought online or at grocery. These are the people we have to reach. We have to explain to them that, hey, you are getting into the aviation system. You need to understand you have responsibilities. So we've had our advisory survey. Uh, 9157 has been in place for a long time. There's, never, there's not been any issues, etc. But that's because the folks in the upper picture knew that it was there, they knew their responsibilities, they knew the rules because of the way the community works. So what have we done? Well, last year in June, we published the interpret rule. And interpret rules are something that I had no idea that existed until about a year ago. And what it is is a public announcement by the FAA of how we're interpreting the existing rules. Now, we put it out for comment because arguably maybe we didn't, we didn't get it exactly right. And we got 30,000 comments against this. So obviously a lot of folks thought that we didn't get it right. So we've kind of suspended you know, implementation of anything new and different in here until we get those resolved. That comment resolution is in process and, and the uh, interpretive rule will probably be updated with uh, resolution of those comments. But the bottom line is still the case, is that aircraft, in, by law, unmanned aircraft are aircraft. They operate in the system, and they are subject to the FAA safety rules. And, and even the legislation that gave the modelers uh, special dispensation, a special rule for model aircraft, states that the FAA has the authority in, in implemented safety rules, which is essentially what we were trying to explain in the interpretive rule. Now, one thing you also have to understand, the FAA is not about enforcement. I mean, I know that that kind of seems, seems to be the public face at times, but it's really not what we're about. We're about compliance. And compliance is much more important than enforcement. We can't be everywhere. We, voluntary compliance is sort of the way the system works. And we only want to get involved in to the really bad actors and identify them and, and communicating with them. And then, you know, ultimately, if we are really forced to, doing enforcement is the way we want to go forward. So we issued some, some guidance to our folks in the field. The first one was to our inspectors, reiterating that, hey, it's about compliance, not enforcement. So step one, anytime you are coming to contact someone who isn't operating according to the rules, is talk to them, explain the rules to them. We have a standard letter that we've sent out to like, you know, it's the last count, at least 80 people, uh, probably more that haven't even documented in our system. We have verbal conversations with the folks, explaining to the rules, and the large majority of people immediately go, oh, I didn't know, I'm sorry, I won't do it again. And that's, that's where we want to go, and that's where it ends. However, the, we, we do have enforcement cases. I mean, there's, there's nine cases out there pending, but that's nine out of a much, much larger number of ones that we've dealt with through uh, communicating with the folks. Another thing we did to help us with this is we sent out guidance to our law enforcement friends. FAA has a long history of working closely with law enforcement, state, local, federal. And so one of the things we've done is we sent out guidance to them. It's also available on our website. Basically say, hey, look, you're the person on scene. Here's, here's what you can do and what you can't do when it comes, because we hear a lot of questions about I mean, one, of, you know, one incident, there was a, a police protection videotape watching somebody fly uh, their quadcopter in a place where they shouldn't. So we said, you know, we really need to let the law enforcement folks know that they have, can play a role in this and what role that should be. So the idea there is we're recruiting them to help us with this you know, communication, informing the public about what the, what the rules are, et cetera. So that guidance is out there as well. Anything we can do to get the word out better. We're also uh, working with our industry partners, uh, the AMA, the Small UAV Coalition, and AUBSI, and now we've got some other participants as well, uh, on the Know Before You Fly campaign. There's a website uh, out there that you can go and it helps give you information about uh, what you should and shouldn't do uh, when you're flying. And, and there's more to come. 
So next week at AUBSI, we're going to be uh, making a couple of significant announcements on the 6th, uh, starting at about 10.45 uh, a.m., and there will be signs at AUBSI saying where uh, these press conferences are going to be. The FAA administrator is going to be in town making a couple of announcements. So uh, there's, there's more to come from the FAA, so please join us in, at AUBSI next week. And I allow for a lot of time for uh, Q&A, because I know that basically you know, from last year and previous experiences talking to crowds of, of operators, that there are just a lot of questions out there. And that's the main reason why we go to these events, is to help communicate what the rules are, how they work, how you can comply. So um, Pat, I'll leave it to Patrick to cut it off when he's done, but then we can open up for questions. And I'll, we'll, we'll pass the microphone, this microphone around and I'll use this one. Thank so you. Please. We get him to turn this one on? He's coming. He's okay. coming. So please identify who you are and uh, next question. Hi, my name is Mr. Conrad. I fly. <coughs> UAVs. Um, I'm curious what the definition of a densely populated area is. And also, what it means, you know, how do you define flying over people? Like, if I'm flying over our houses in my neighborhood, am I flying over people? Am I, am I in a densely populated area if I fly in my neighborhood or even in the city? So, when, when we do an approval through the certificate of uh, waiver of authorization process, we evaluate whether or not we consider it to be a you know densely populated area. So it's that's that's the process. In the the blanket COA, we we have some more guidance about how about what that works. But what's really more important is that you're not flying over non participants. That's that's the key. And so the I mean it's even conceivable that you could fly in, a, in an area like like this one as long as you had control of the the operating area and, and yes yes surrounding area is densely populated, but if you had the Presidio shut down for your operation, you could probably get that approved. So there's, there's really no hard, fast rule as far as a population density number or you know anything as, as concrete as that. So it, it's kind of based on a case-by-case -case basis. And, and the, really the key is not flying over non-participants and, and making sure there's a setback distance from those non-participants to keep them safe if your aircraft uh, has a malfunction. Thank you. One one more question. If I fly indoors, no, FAA is not regulating indoors. And, and, awesome. And indoors can even be if you had a big cage, a big netted area. That's not part of the nets. As soon as, as soon as it's not navigable by uh, air, aircraft in the in the national airspace system, it's no longer uh, under the FAA's jurisdiction. So thank you. Hi, my name is Jason White. Uh, I got a question from the extreme, actually, uh, from Jonathan Harris. Uh, he's asking, is there a way to contact the FAA directly or get periodic updates in the FAA regarding the status of our 333 progress? It would be great to know where it is in the review process. Yeah, that, that email address I gave you, you can send in, in questions about the status of your 333 uh, application to that, but that uh, email address. Okay. And as a person statement, I'd like to say I can totally see a change from this year to, from last year to this year in terms of, it seemed more like the stick early on for a while, and now I'm feeling a lot of carrot in terms of uh, actually having a process and being able to go through it. And nothing else getting the right feedback to the right people. Thank you, Hi, Peggy, my name is Matthew Levin. I'm a pilot and cinematographer for Air uh, The biggest question that we have been trying to answer as we're going through our own 333 process is, why a pilot to operate a craft that has its own set of operations, understanding mechanical um, protocol, uh, stick adjustments. When we've been working in the field, mostly we've seen accidents happen with pilots, as opposed to RC operators who seem to have a better understanding of the RC craft. We've seen pilots with years of piloting experience come in with months of um, quadcopter experience, get a 333 exemption, and now are on their way working professionally without knowing 
anything about the production protocol to bring a service to the people. I think it's what 80% of the doctors out there are filming something. And so the idea that it's just about the craft or the technology, but what about the integration and the use of it in the particular environment? For instance, when you ask about indoors and flying, there is still great risk, if not more. And so, although the FAA is now not responsible for that, clearly there is a big gap now for a lot of people going and flying indoors. We've already seen the accidents. And, but yet there's no um, help, I think, from the FAA, right? They still have a relationship there. So the reason you have to have a pilot certificate is because it's in the law. The, the FAA's Authorization Act requires a, every aircraft, you know, by the way, that same Authorization Act <coughs> declared all unmanned aircraft to be aircraft. So thereby hooking all of those rules in that say aircraft. Uh, so you have to have a pilot certificate. And the, the, the lowest level pilot certificate we've uh, believe is acceptable is the sport pilot uh, certificate. So that's what we're doing for section 333. If you look at FAR 107, it creates a new type of pilot certificate. So it still complies with the law, uh, and you obviously it's more tailored toward this particular type of aircraft. What we're, what we're really after is knowledge of the airspace, understanding that you are operating an aircraft in the national airspace system and you have responsibilities as such and that's what you're really looking for when it comes to having meeting that pilot kind of requirement. Uh, I, I mean I understand you and there's a lot of folks out there who want to offer uh, training for operating that manned aircraft and, and we, we encourage that and higher risk operations you know we would have to look at what the pilot requirements will be for those higher risk operations. Remember Part 107, part, you know, the 333 exemptions are intended to be the very, very lowest yeah. risk operations that would exist in the national airspace system. So we're definitely taking that into consideration going forward. Patrick, you weren't in the room, but I said you got to cut them off because I know we'll be up here. Yeah, I, I just wanted to say that. I mean, if it's a question, it's got to be a question. You're, I mean, there was a lot of yeah, information I, in there. I, but if I, I try to answer that, yeah. so okay. let's try and make it quick. Go ahead. Okay. Good afternoon, Jeffrey Antonelli from Antonelli Wong. We're doing a lot of Section 333 petitions, and we'd like to be able to bring the price down and uh, abbreviate our petitions to match the summary grant process. However, what we're being told from FAA is that the guidance for petitions have not changed. Right. Is, is there a, a way that we can work on that so we can bring the price down, show that it, it fits into the slot of approved, previously approved exemptions? All I can tell you is look at the exemptions that we've been granting, look at the instructions, you know, and, and follow the process. I mean, we can't uh, grant something before it's submitted. We can't tell people what exactly has to be in the in the grant. That would be rulemaking. So, you know, I think we've reached the level of compromise that, or not compromise, we've re reached the level of process that's appropriate for the what we're doing that meets the existing regulations about how we grant exemptions, complies with the uh, the act that sets up the rules around rulemaking, because these are still, every one of these grants is a rulemaking action. So we have to follow the precepts of the rulemaking process. So it is what it is. Basically, it's a exception process that we've managed to morph into an approval process. And so there's gonna be disconnects because of that. Sorry. Okay, thank you. Hey, Jim, John Oliver with Arrow City. How are you? Um, quick question about the 333 process for getting new systems approved. If you're a 333 exempt company and you're trying to get a new system approved, what's, what is that process like and how do you grant it? It's called an amendment. Yeah. So essentially you petition for amendment and, and it's, it's fairly routine. Adding aircraft is something we've done for mm -hmm. many, many of the existing 333 holders. Uh, you know, you register it, you petition, and all we do is look to make sure it fits in the same sort of window that you've already been approved for and, and you're good to go. So that, those move pretty quickly. Okay, what's the timeline like for those? I, I hate to give a specific commitment because it, it's going to vary based on, you know, if it's... If Let's it's say it's a pre-approved system for someone else. Yeah. 
I hate to commit to a timeline because there's, you know, there's lots of different things going on. I mean, I, I think we would ultimately like to do them in two weeks or less, okay. but we can't commit to that because of the volume we're trying to do of the original ones and the amendments. It's all the same people. <coughs> okay, great. Thank you, sir. Rob Danberg, D9 Solutions. Uh, does the FAA have any guidance on how to deal with uh, misinformation within the local law enforcement community? Um, where I live up in Washington, referring to our published guidance, I have that I've actually taken it guidance. and cleaned it, but I feel like a liaison officer that doesn't work for the FAA that goes and talks to local law enforcement and says, "Here's here's the guidance." And they're like, well, we want to do it differently. I'm like, okay, you guys have the right to do that if you want. But when an eight-year-old kid gets a $150 fine for flying a one-inch helicopter in his yard, and they're saying that's what the FAA told us to do. Oh, man. They're, they're pushing the blame on you. We understand it's not. Is there anything Don't be just pushing on the site? That's all we can do. Well, okay. no, there's also an FAA liaison uh, regional office who, whose job it is to work. Right, they've actually been great in helping, helping with it. I was just wondering if there's anything. Everybody here sees community. We're out flying. We get we get it. Is there any quick access that we can say? The, those FAA liaison, uh, law enforcement liaison officers are the quickest access to the FAA. That's their job. That full time job is to you know interface with and answer questions from law enforcement. So if you can convince them to talk to them, you'd be that'd be the way to go. Perfect. Thanks. Hi, Brad Huber, investor entrepreneur. Uh, question is. What do you see as the timeline and the process for uh, beyond visual line of sight applications? <laughs> Still don't have that crystal ball. Uh, the, but the real answer is it depends on who's asking for the approval. So we, we've already approved beyond visual line of sight operations off the coast of Alaska in, in the Arctic. Uh, we set up a procedural separation methodology by which you coordinate demand and unmanned operations in that operating environment. We've got it on the charts. Flight service does the coordination. So we, we've already approved it. We've demonstrated it can approve. The aircraft is approved. The pilots were approved. The operating uh, rules were approved, and it's coordinated. So I would say it just depends on you know the, the applicant. You got to get your aircraft approved and your, your operating approvals done, and then you're off and running. Okay. And so just like that for like Matternet or companies like that. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Uh, my question is regarding uh, do university US research work? That also comes under the same 333 exemption, or they have different filings or exemptions? So the, the whole university thing has been uh, a quandary created by Section 336. Most <coughs> universities used to operate as modelers. But technically, the way that law is written, it says hobby or recreational purposes only. Well, obviously, education isn't either hobby or recreation, so it kind of put them into, into a gray area. And so what we've been telling the schools is, look, if you want to use unmanned aircraft in your curriculum, then get a 333 or experimental for the aircraft and you're good to go. Because it's really the airworthiness piece that's, that's held most of them back. But it, it, they can't, because you can't do it as a uh, public aircraft operator either, even if you're a public university, you can't. That doesn't fit, or we would have all of the the flight training schools like you know, North Dakota and and, uh, and many many others who, who offer degrees in flight training. The, all of those are done with FAA certified aircraft using FAA certified pilots and pilot certificates, etc. And so that same rule set applies when universities are using unmanned aircraft. One last thing, are there any provisions to, for example, universities want to do high degree research and which is not bound by 333? So if, if you were doing research on unmanned aircraft or sensors used by unmanned aircraft and you're a public university, you can do self-certification. <coughs> the private universities would need to get a some sort of certificate for the aircraft, either an experimental or a 333. Because again, back to that, the law says if it's a civil aircraft, then civil means non-government. You have to be a registered, you have to have an airworthiness certificate, and you have to have a certificated pilot. So the ways to move forward there are experimental, which can be a certificated aircraft, which is probably most appropriate for research and build. Thank you.
Uh, so just to follow up on that, so you do need to have airworthiness certified prior to applying for a 333? No, 333 is an exemption from the airworthiness certification. Okay, so that's not required if we file an application. Well, the, the only thing required is, is registration. Okay, got it. So Thanks. you register it, five by fee, send in the paperwork, and get, get it registered. Okay, thank you. <coughs> Hi, I'm uh, Mac Higgins in Nevada Dynamics. So now that unmanned aircraft are kind of definitively aircraft, where what are we looking at with, or what is your outlook on ADSB and the integration of that hardware and MODIS transponders into the small aircraft? So the way the ADSB transponder rules work is they're based on the airspace where you operate. Okay. So we don't have any plans for changing that right now. There's no rulemaking project process going forward. So if you're operating in airspace where that's required, we expect you to be equipped or have a waiver for, for operating there without, which you can get. I mean, there's, you know, every, every day there's an air carrier or aircraft that has a failure in their transponder and they get a waiver to fly it back to their home base and fix it. You know, that's, that's fairly routine. But uh, in general, airspace rules apply to all aircraft and their own. Hi, Gabriel Deval with Inspect Tools. Um, got a couple of uh, requests for just definitions and a comment. Um, earlier, you suggested the, uh, or introduced the concept of non navigable airspace, uh, not counting as uh, NAS. I was wondering if you could uh, expound on that a little bit. So, the lawyers will tell you that the navigable airspace is defined by, where, by which, uh, where an aircraft can safely navigate. So the definition of navigable airspace changed tremendously when unmanned aircraft were declared to be aircraft. So essentially anywhere that you can fly out in, in the space out there is navigable airspace and so therefore it's under the, the regulatory authority of the FAA. A lot of people get confused between navigable airspace and controlled airspace. Controlled airspace is where air traffic control has uh, certain requirements for entering that airspace, but pretty much everywhere outside, unless it's contained within a cage or a building, is navigable by aircraft now. And uh, two quick questions on the uh, sub two kilo uh, NPRM. Uh, one is regarding uh, autonomous flight and things like uh, you know, multi-copters are essentially fly-by-wire uh, at minimum and are you know, arguably autonomous just by definition. Um, how are, are you guys going to uh, apply autonomous? So autonomy is misused work. ICAO has a definition for autonomous aircraft. And that is an aircraft that can't have an intervention by a human being on the ground during its flight. And, and even cruise missiles don't meet that criteria. Because cruise missiles, I found out from the military, can be recalled or, or diverted once they're in flight. So most of the unmanned aircraft are highly automated. In other words, they can fly on their own, but there's a pilot somewhere monitoring their, their progress and their behavior who can send instructions to change their flight. That's not an autonomous aircraft. That's a highly automated aircraft. And so then it just becomes a matter of uh, certifying that aircraft for that level of autonomy. In other words, how much do you have to have the software certified, and et cetera, et cetera, and that's based on the operation, the size of their vehicle, et cetera, that risk-based approach that I talked about. Can I ask one more quick question? Uh, just in regards to the frangible uh, definition. Um, Don't have one. We were hoping the industry would provide us one. That's why we asked for comments in the room. Thank you. All right, so that was good. I clarified that. But uh, thank you, Jim.